It is now 12 o'clock. This is Carla Joseph. I'm the co-chair of the Education Committee for the West San Gabriel Valley Association. Um, wait, wait a minute. West San Gabriel Valley Realtors changed our name. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are pleased to have with us this afternoon a very, very knowledgeable speaker. But before I introduce him, I'd like to ask everyone to please mute your phones to minimize any background noise. So the speaker this afternoon will be Mr. Ami Adini. He, has, he is a veteran environmental consultant with over 40 years of experience. He carries a Bachelor of Science degree in mechanical engineering with credits in nuclear and chemical engineering. Mr. Adini has been personally responsible for over 2,000 phase one and phase two site assessments in commercial and industrial properties and remediation of contaminated soil, removal, of in, removal and installation of dozens of underground storage tank facilities. As you can see, he has a host of qualifications and experience much more than I just read but without further ado, we'll have Mr. Adini take the floor. Hello, everybody. And uh, for a few minutes, I will share with you uh, myself. I hope you see me now in my yes. home office. Great. Yes. So that's where I am. And after sharing with you my picture alive, I will turn back to my still picture so I don't get myself distracted by my own moving uh, face. But just uh, I wanted to welcome you and uh, it's a very nice uh, day today. Um, let us move to, my present to the presentation. Uh, we are going to uh, evaluate environmental risk uh, concerns uh, through the uh, phase one and phase two environmental uh, site assessment process. And uh, I have a job here. I need to explain to you well. I mean, um, the, um, our old uh, Mr. Professor Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. So my job is to explain it to you so that you can understand it, make it simple to you so that you will know that I understand what I'm talking about. Uh, as about myself, uh, yes, I'm an environmental uh, professional by the definition of the United States EPA. And I've been doing it since uh, 1988, phase one and phase two environmental assessments. Uh, the whole industry started about 1986, and I was fortunate to enter it into a very uh, early stage. Uh, one of the very first projects that we did was not far away from San Gabriel, was in the city of Arcadia. And we had to clean up a one acre site here behind the uh, Embassy Suites Hotel. It's there to this day, the Embassy Suites. Right now, this site is a Marriott uh, residence inn. And at the time, it's contaminated with lead from uh, past uh, operations. It's about one acre. And then back in 19, early 1988, uh, it was about $1 million to clean it up. So translating it to today's money, one million of 1988, maybe some of you will do the computation better than me, but I think it probably will be in the range of two or three million dollars nowadays. Uh, from there, we moved to work with the Texaco USA. They had a big judgment against them. They had to liquidate in a hurry a lot of properties and they retained us to investigate 72 oil and gas producing properties all over California. Uh, which we did in a hurry. Uh, from there, we moved to work with the city of Anaheim. Again, again in 1988, uh, they had plans there to develop uh, what is today the downtown district or the uh, civil, uh, the civic uh, uh, district around it. There was about 500 properties there, commercial, industrial, residential, and we had to go uh, property to property. We do a phase one and a phase two, and there were some surprises there tanks that nobody knew about them and others. And uh, yeah, as far as my education, yes, I graduated in 1964 um, in an uh, institute called the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, located in Haifa on Mount Carmel. Uh, in, uh, when I was born, it used to be Palestine, then it became the state of Israel. This is Haifa. 
Here is the Mediterranean Sea, and here is in the back, this is the city of Acre, a very, very ancient city, uh, had the, um, a very a famous uh, fortress of the uh, Crusaders, uh, which uh, I believe that they surrendered about 1291. So there's a lot of history. The city of Acre here is the holiest city for uh, the Baha'i faith. Overall, Israel and Middle East has a lot of history there. Um, graduated in 1964, moved to work with the Israeli Atomic Energy Commission uh, in uh, nuclear facilities, did uh, maintenance operations and the construction of nuclear facilities for eight years. From there, I moved to work in the Dead Sea for several years, uh, talking about a hot place. First of all, this is about 400 meters, about 1,300 feet below sea level, and in the summer when we worked there, temperature in the sun could reach 100, over 130 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was hot, <laughs> I can tell you. Uh, the saving grace was that it was hot and, and dry. Humidity was about 5%, so we did not sweat, but we had to drink nonstop. Uh, from there, I uh, moved to work in uh, various chemical facilities, 1975 to 1988. Again, as an engineer designing, process, designing, constructing, operating various facilities, and uh, immigrated in 1977 to the United States, uh, became a citizen in 1985, uh, became a contractor, started my own business in uh, 1987. I became a contractor in 1989, a general engineering contractor. In theory, I can build you the uh, whatever. A skyscraper, but in practice, I use this uh, license to clean up contaminated properties. And uh, I have a classification in the hazardous substance removal. So I can remove hazardous substances and qualify to do it per all regulations and uh, per all standards of uh, safety. A uh, very recent project that we did under the um, oversight of the California EPA Department of Toxic Substances Control here in Los Angeles is in the Silver Lake community where we cleaned up a property that was contaminated with pesticides. Uh, here you see that this, these piles represent about 1,000 uh, cubic yards of uh, soil that is contaminated with pesticides and we finished it recently and soon it's going to become a 16-unit apartment building and everybody will be happy. Uh, you, can, you are always uh, welcome to visit our website. Uh, we, it's rich with environmental enlightenment newsletters. Uh, these letters are designed for the lay, what I call the lay person, the lay people, meaning the people that are not uh, deep into our technologies. And they are written in a very simple language. It's full of pictures because we think the pictures tell the story better than anything else. So uh, what is a phase one? We are going to deal with a phase one. This is one of the steps of evaluation of the risk in, uh, in, in real estate transaction. And some of the questions that we will answer today will be phase one. What does it do? Even more important, what, it does, what does it not do? There are some sometimes uh, misconceptions in the industry about what can what phase one can uh, can provide. Uh, it provides a lot of important things, but there are certain things that it will not provide. Uh, phase two is it always necessary? Uh, what's the cost of phase two? How long does it take? Uh, contaminated property is it the end of the deal? If we have, can we not or do we not deal with contaminated property? Of course, the answer is no. Yes, there is a way to deal and transact and make a good living even with contaminated properties. Uh, do all contaminated properties require remediation? The answer is no, not, and we will talk about it. What does it take to remove environmental risk from the real estate transaction? This is the most practical question that I'm being asked by real estate uh, uh, stakeholders, and we will respond to that. Questions. If you have questions, I found that the most uh, efficient way is for me to respond personally uh, to each one of you. Uh, you are always welcome uh, to contact me by telephone, by text, by email, and I can assure you that I will dedicate uh, unlimited time in terms of unlimited until you will be happy with the uh, question, with the answer that I give you. 
happy means that you will be educated enough. <laughs> you may you may get an answer and you may get an answer that you don't like, but still even bad answers are better than no answers because at least you know what you are dealing with. Uh, talk, talking about risk, okay, uh, there is always risk in everything uh, that we do uh, in life. And general Patton is uh, of uh, World War II fame, a very famous uh, risk taker, told us that uh, you take calculated risk that is quite different from being rash. Uh, so there is always the risk element that we are trying to calculate. However, there is the other element, which is the element of time. If we are trying to calculate and calculate and calculate and calculate the risk and, on, and not move, then we are losing time. And uh, uh, Anna Maria Andretti, a very famous uh, race car driver, is telling us that if things seem under control, you are just not going fast enough. So we cannot, always, we cannot reach ultimate control of everything. We have to move uh, forward even when we don't have the control. I mean, we don't have the complete control, whereas we have to have definitely a certain amount of control. So uh, you will hear about plumes, and just excuse me for a second because I need to take a drink of water. Okay, so uh, plumes. Uh, in environmental, we talk a lot about plumes, and it comes from feathers. Uh, originally, a plume is a long soft feather arrangement or feathers used by a bird for display or worn by a person. The uh, concept of the plume is something that starts at a point and expands from there on forward. So a plume always have a source. It has a source and you can see here those stacks uh, sending out huge plumes of smoke. And this is plume, it starts here at the top of the stack and then it expands. So here are a few plumes uh, in the picture. We see here uh, on the left, uh, there is an underground tank and it is leaking and it discharges contaminant into the uh, aquifer. The aquifer is in this turquoise. And let me tell you right away that aquifer is not a lake and is, it's not a subterranean lake and it's not uh, a pool. It is basically soil which is saturated with water, not unlike the little hole that you dig in the beach sand and it's, uh, the water start coming at you. The water come out of the sand. This is aquifer. It is a formation of sand or rock that carries water. Aqui, aqua means water, fer means to carry. So aquifer is something which carries water. And so here we have this plume, the purple plume is going down into the aquifer, but it is made of a substance that is heavier than water and is going all the way down. Here is another discharge, another plume of substance which is lighter than water. It floats on the aquifer and it doesn't go down. It contaminates the soil around it and it contaminates the upper surface of the groundwater and it evaporates and it evaporates and it goes into uh, a building. The vapors go uh, into the building. So in the real estate transactions and also in the uh, environmental industry, but uh, we deal with the three, what we call the three environmental elements, which is the soil, water, and air. We are interested in contamination that impacts the soil, that impacts the water and impacts the air. And when we deal with real estate transactions, this is what we are looking at. What is in the soil? What is in the groundwater under the property? What is in the air inside the property or what surrounds the property? These are the three elements. The element of air uh, has become uh, a major element in our industry nowadays and also in a, by quite a major element in the uh, environmental and regulatory uh, uh, regions of, of our industry. The vapors are the unseen uh, enemy, if you wish, that enters uh, and a very light concentrations can create a pretty significant risk sometimes. So um, we became interested, we started to become interested in vapors in the early 2000. Before 2004, 2005, uh, we didn't care about it. Right? Not that we didn't care, we just did not have the awareness uh, of it. 
and anything that we don't have awareness of, of course, we don't care about. So uh, we did not know much about it. There was no awareness. It started, we started to be aware of it around 2004, 2005. And nowadays in 2020, we are very aware of it. Um, here is another diagram uh, showing vapors entering into a building, uh, subterranean vapors. Here they are, the, here is a plume on the left and it's contaminating the soil and it goes to groundwater and the vapors come from the groundwater and from the soil and they enter uh, into the buildings through various places, through the cracks in the slabs, through the crawl space, uh, through floor cracks in the basement. The uh, vapor thing, or uh, the vapor concern has become uh, so significant, I should say, uh, and it is demonstrated by numbers. And uh, there is a certain factor that is we call attenuation factor. Here it is, attenuation. When you attenuate something, you make it less. To attenuate is to make it less. So here, let's take a random number, 1,000, whatever units, milligrams per uh, meter, meter cube, or for example, it could be 1,000. Early on, uh, the industry thought that, uh, and it, it makes sense that you have 1,000 in the soil, not all of it gets into the building. It evaporates, it has to travel through the soil, it has to, to go through all these obstacles and enter into the building. No, therefore, not all of the 1,000 will enter into the building. So there comes this attenuation factor. We are trying to, to get, not to guess, but to calculate and to predict how much of the 1,000 will get into the building. And early on, uh, based on experience and some theoretical models, the attenuation factor was 0 0.001. That means that if it was 1,000 in this subsurface, then we said, well, okay, it could be one, it could be one in the building. Well, uh, in recent years, the United States EPA did the studies of, well, I think about over like 800 properties uh, in various places of the US, I think including California. And they had their results and they determined that it is not one, it is 30, okay? So that means 1,000, it's not one. When, it, uh, when I have a 1,000 in the soil, it could be 30 in the building. And this factor, this attenuation factor now has become, instead of 0 0.001, 0 0.030. So that means uh, a lot more risk from vapor intrusion into the buildings. And uh, that has now become, uh, I would say, the major concern in our industry, and especially in the phase one and the phase two, which we'll talk about uh, uh, later. Uh, we first and foremost nowadays are concerned about the vapor uh, the soil, yes, the soil could be contaminated and it is a concern because it is a concern in terms of that uh, you have to clean it up because you don't want maybe children to play in it, you don't want uh, uh, people to, to ingest in it, but how many times somebody takes a soil, even a child, and ingests on it and takes it into their mouth? Yes, it can happen, but the risk is relatively uh, smaller than the risk when you have vapor entering into the building because you inhale them 24-7. Uh, uh, same with groundwater. Yes, groundwater is contaminated, but it is uh, a, a, an element of risk in real estate transactions because the government will make the responsible party clean up the, the groundwater. So there is a cost issue here, that, and the cost issue is a factor in the transaction because the responsible party will have to clean it up and it can cost, it can cost hundreds of thousands, maybe over a million, sometimes a couple of million dollars, sometimes even more to clean up contaminated groundwater. It's not easy. But then again, groundwater is not, in most cases, is not an immediate risk to the occupants of the building. Vapors is immediate risk. So therefore we have a lot of attention to the on vapors inside the building. So here is a case uh, that we did uh, recently and uh, uh, here is uh, our client uh, owns this uh, residential uh, building and, uh, and they needed to um, uh, refinance. And the lender tell them, okay, we will refinance it, we will, but uh, there is a balloon payment due, but we will, we, we will refinance on the condition that you give us a clean bill of health. We want to know that there is no risk for the occupants uh, of the building. 
So they do a phase one, uh, another company, not our company in this case, and the phase one consultant says, well, we have dry cleaners here, and dry cleaners are uh, known to produce and have produced uh, uh, contamination that volatilizes in the ground, evaporates in the ground, and moves as a vapor in the ground. So they say, well, we have this uh, dry cleaner. So we are, they retain our company to investigate, see if there is any impact on this building. So we do it. Uh, we poke holes around the building, we we'll go around, uh, poke holes in the ground, and we suck out, we suck out like a suction blower, like a vacuum cleaner. We suck out the vapor uh, from around the building. We test it, and the answer is, yep, the, uh, it is contaminated. The vapor traveled, and we uh, show it here like, like a subterranean cloud. It traveled from the dry cleaner under the building. This is quote unquote the bad news, but the good news is that the levels of the contamination are such, uh, are so low that they do not pose risk to the occupant of the building. So we issue the report and we say, yes, there is vapor, but no, it is not in the risk level. They go to the bank and they get the loan. Here is another case, uh, the real estate uh, investor is calling me, always they call me at late at night, and he says, Ami, I'm interested, he's interested in this uh, apartment complex. They've already done phase one, they've already done phase two, they've done all of the investigations that needed to be done. There was a dry cleaner here in this uh, shopping uh, strip here. They contaminated, they know it is contaminated, and they know it is contaminated at a certain level. So, they send me the report and I tell them, yes, you are contaminated. Yes, you are contaminated uh, above the risk level. It, it, it poses risk to the occupants of the building. And they say, well, is this the end of the deal? Well, I say it all depends. You know, it depends. You can do something about it. As long as you can do something about it, maybe it's not the end of the day. He says, what can I do about it? I say, well, you can defend uh, the building you can put around the building a certain defense mechanisms, and we will talk about it later, which will protect the occupants of the buildings from the risk of inhalation of toxic vapors. He says, how much? I say, well, I think you're looking maybe at 400,000, 500,000 at the end of the day. So at least he's got a number that he can plug into the equation and decide if he wants uh, to purchase the property. It's not the end of the day. Um, one of the ways how we can uh, explain to him how to do it is uh, very much like we do with methane. Not that I say we, not that my company, we don't deal with methane, but it is um, a well-developed uh, uh, technology nowadays uh, where uh, if there is a methane in the ground and you don't want the methane to enter into the building because methane is explosive, uh, you install under the building, you install these pipes, there are perforated pipes, you connect them to vents, and you ventilate the subsurface under the building. Here you have the concrete slab that uh, protects the building, and then everything, everything that in this, the soil basically is getting vented out, so it does not enter into the building, it goes out to the atmosphere field, and life does not come to an end when you sit on a polluted ground. There are, there are ways to handle it and, and continue life. Um, here is an example. Our client is interested, was interested, is still interested because he, ac he acquired this building here. At the time when they uh, consulted with us, they were interested. They knew it is contaminated. The contaminator is sitting uh, here and it is well known uh, site and they contaminated the entire area here with toxic vapors. They're traveling here. Here is the cloud. And my client, he wants this building. So what, what shall I do? He said, so, okay, well, we test around it and we tell him you can, again, you can install those systems around the building, defend yourself and you're home free. They do this, they like the buildings, they do a good business there. They install whatever to be installed and they move forward. And uh, here is another case, uh, very, quite interesting. Uh, this building is uh, nowadays is kind of small office building, maybe insurance company, maybe a doctor. I don't know right now, because when we investigated it, it was about 2006, I think, so 14 years ago. And uh, it used to be a dry cleaners, and uh, they created contamination, and we tested it, and we found this uh, vapor cloud, subterranean vapor cloud, 
But the interesting or the uh, troublesome thing was about it that the cloud migrated to this area, which is entirely um, high class residential. So we have here residences which are sitting on a cloud of toxic material. Uh, it's called the PCE or PERC, we will talk more about it, uh, which is sitting under the property and they are not even aware of it. Uh, so usually um, when we deal or when you as real estate people dealing with resident residences like here, uh, usually you don't do phase one and we do not recommend to do phase one usually on residences. But when your residential property is sitting on a borderline with commercial industrial, you may want to know what is happening behind the fence, like in this case. Uh, yes, these uh, vapors, toxic vapors, they even use the sewer systems uh, to travel through them. Uh, here is a case uh, that uh, I think uh, one of my listeners today, I saw here in the list, uh, she is very familiar with the case. And uh, it's a case of an industrial uh, facility and uh, it is contaminated, uh, groundwater is contaminated, soil is contaminated, uh, soil vapor is contaminated, but still again, it's not the end of the deal. Uh, we have investigated it, we know everything that has to be known about it, and a prospective buyer came there and they were interested and they purchased it with full knowledge of what they are purchasing it. Uh, the property is clean, uh, was estimated at about four and a half million dollar. Uh, the uh, buyer purchased it for about three and a half million dollars. They took a certain risk and now they are continuing. They are doing what has to be done. Eventually the case uh, will reach uh, a very uh, satisfactory uh, condition. And I think they will come very well on, on their investment. So yes, you can deal with contaminated properties. Uh, here is a property, uh, what we did, uh, you see all those red circles, these are indoor uh, uh, tester, what we test, they are uh, sampler, we sample uh, the uh, air inside the building, so we design it so that we sampled it in six locations inside the building, we sampled it in several locations outside the buildings, and this is how we did it, uh, these are the canisters that collect air. We install them inside the buildings. As you saw in the diagram, we had six of them inside the building. They have a name called SUMA. It's just a name, SUMA, SUMA canisters. And it's about, I think it's about one gallon, I think, in, in capacity. And uh, we evacuate them, make it a total vacuum. And then we place them inside the building. And here you see one of them installed here inside the building. It has a pressure regulator here, and we adjust the pressure regulator so this canister will fill in eight hours. So we place it there and slowly and slowly in eight hours, it fills out with air around inside the building, which is goes into it. At the end of the day, we take it, we send it to the lab and they tell us uh, the average contamination in the air in the building during the eight hours uh, that we tested the building. And as you see, we put also one outside the building because we always want to compare inside and outside. Uh, here is another case where we tested indoor and outdoor air. This was uh, near LAX. Again, you see those SUMA canisters inside the building. They collect the air inside the building. You see here is one outside the building. Here is another one outside. And here's another one outside. And the interesting, uh, interesting, case, interesting thing here was that the uh, air outside the property uh, was more contaminated than the air inside the property. Again, it is the, the level of contaminations were not at such levels that presented the risk to human health, and, uh, but they were there. And uh, the obvious conclusion was that the co contaminated air inside the building came from the outside. So there was a contaminator, which was not our client, not, uh, which was located outside and they were sending their vapors uh, into the property. And it happens. Here is a very famous case, a celebrated case, if you wish, of uh, Howard Hughes uh, aircraft uh, industry. It was here in the 1980s. This is what is today Playa Vista. 
here is the Marina del Rey, just for orientation, here is LAX, okay, here is a beautiful uh, Santa Monica Beach and Venice Beach, uh, which I love and I'm sure many of you love this place, and uh, here is Playa Vista. So Playa Vista is sitting on what used to be Howard Hughes aircraft in the 1980s, and they contaminated it uh, big time. And since the late 80s, this place has been under a cleanup. And uh, here is a, a, a magnified view of the, of the port of Playa Vista. And here is a magnified view of the place that is contaminated. And groundwater is contaminated here. Groundwater is it's very shallow. I think maybe five feet or 10 feet, uh, very shallow here. And it's all contaminated. Not only contaminated, the contamination has gone, has spread. Uh, outward from this property here in this direction, northwest. The groundwater here is moving northwest and it moved outside of the property into these uh, areas, which is uh, mixed uh, residences, uh, mixed commercial, residential, industrial nowadays. Uh, here is a graphic illustration of the contamination. All what I wanted to show you, to show you here were some colors. It's not our company. This is done by another consultant. Uh, that has been working on it. Again, they work, they, the uh, EPA, in this case, the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board is in charge, and they have been working on, working on it since the late 1980s. And the contamination traveled outside of the property. Why is it of interest to us? Uh, not so much because we are interested in this uh, Playa Vista property. Everything is known about there. But, and let's continue. Uh, sorry. Uh, the uh, regional board here, which is in charge of the case, uh, got interested in what is happening outside of Playa Vista here, because they said, well, yes, indeed, we know that uh, old Howard Hughes, he contaminated, uh, contaminated us and it moved outside. But we also know that there used to be um, several uh, commercial industrial here that they were working with Howard Hughes at the time, and nowadays they are, they are working for themselves in various occupations. And uh, we are interested to know if they have contributed to the contamination. So they retained a consultant, not our company, another consultant, and uh, they run a very quick uh, research about the history of the properties here, and they flag, you see, all these red triangles, all these red flags are properties that they indicate to the California EPA that these properties might be a contaminator based on their history. That's all what is known right now. Just based on their history, uh, this used to be a machine shop, this used to be uh, whatever, uh, another machine shop. And because of that, they might have contaminated. So these are all might have, maybe. And they flag them out. Well, our client is one of them. is, is around this area on Jefferson Boulevard. And they um, do a phase one, and the phase one says, well, uh, you know, you might have contaminated. So they do a phase two, and the phase two you say, well, you have, yes, you did contaminate it. Then they hire us, they retain us to tell them again, what is going on there? Go beyond the phase two, go down to groundwater, tell us what is happening with groundwater. And we tell them, look, here's your case, here's your property. This is the uh, uh, green highlighted port. This is your property here. And your case is, yes, you have contamination coming from old Howard Hughes and is moving here. This is the direction of groundwater flow. And yes, it's coming into your property and it's going outside and contamination is moving in and moving out. And this is how much you have under it, but guess what, dear client, you also have contributed to it. And you contributed to it in the slightly, but you have contributed to it. And they say, so what? So that means, okay, well, in the future, uh, you may have a certain liability here. Again, I don't want to get uh, into too many details now because it will take me about half an hour. But the long and short of it is, yes, yes, it is contaminated, but no, it, meaning you can still deal with it. You can still transact with it. There are ways to transact. This is property is located in a very good location on Jefferson Boulevard, and there is a good future to it. So again, the case contaminated, but still you can do good business with it. Uh, here is our client. Another case is located. This is a, he owns this shopping strip. 
uh, groundwater is contaminated, uh, there is a, a, a balloon a payment, balloon loan that is, uh, I'm sorry, that is due soon, and uh, they cannot refinance because groundwater is contaminated. So they retain us and we investigate and we say, well, what do you know? Here is dry cleaner here on this corner of the street and the contamination, they contaminated, they contaminated big time in a large way and contamination traveled from them under the street and moved onto your property. And indeed, many, 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 many years ago, you had some dry cleaner, a very small dry cleaning business here so we do an investigation and we do a lot of borings and a lot of samples and by the time we are done i think it was over one hundred thousand dollars in investigation by the time we were done uh, but uh, here is the uh, contaminator the chief the chief <laughs> quote unquote culprit i'm saying chief quote unquote because these are not bad people uh, so they are culprit only in the sense that they contaminated, but they are not bad people. There are many, many, many good people that uh, caused some contamination unknowingly, but they contaminated. So here they are sitting here and they contaminated it in a large way and it reached groundwater and it traveled across the street. Here is the street is here and it go under the street and comes under our property. And indeed our property, our client contributed something but it is minuscule in comparison to what these guys did here. And it did not reach groundwater. And we show it, we show it uh, black and white, purple and white, uh, that he did not, whatever he did, did not reach groundwater. And we said, he's home free. He's not a contaminator. He's not, he doesn't have any liability. It cost him about another thousand. Uh, okay, here is a very interesting case, very interesting at a certain time, uh, it was uh, scary. And uh, uh, it's industrial property, uh, here it is, this is our property, and the phase one is being done on it, and they say, well, it's industrial, it might have contaminated, uh, you better do a phase two. So we are being retained to do the phase two, we did not do the phase one, we have the, uh, we have the phase one, we know what the phase one indicated the concerns, and we are going to explore these concerns. And the way we explore it, we will drill and take samples. So. The phase one uh, says here, uh, it says they saw one metal covered vault was noted in the northern portion of this area. The consultant was unable to open the vault to identify the contents. However, this feature appeared to be associated with the on-site utility connections. It appeared to be. Well, they made an assumption here and uh, Sometimes it's, it's risky to make assumptions, all right? In this case, they made a um, highly uh, risky assumption. They said it appeared to be uh, this little vault. Well, when we were retained to do the phase two, um, we opened the vault. I moved there, I, I used a small crowbar and a screwdriver. Uh, it didn't take uh, one minute to open, uh, to open it. And here what we see, these are connections to an underground storage tank. So now we know right away, we know, uh-huh, we have a tank here. How big it is, uh, we don't know. So, but we know we have a tank. So we move to explore it. We use those uh, electromagnetic uh, devices. Uh, these are uh, mag magnetometers. Uh, this work on the, like mine detectors, if you wish. Uh, they sense metal in the ground. And here is a radar machine. This is underground, uh, a ground penetrating radar. And it goes into the ground. And we then delineate and we find, okay, here is, we have a tank. Not only that, we know that we know the dimensions of the tank, we calculate and we know it is a 4,000 gallon tank. So we find out that we have a 4,000 gallon tank. And not only that, we, found out, we find out that it is filled with water to the brim. So now we have a tank filled with 4,000 gallons of water. All right. So uh, we call the vacuum truck and uh, uh, our client retain us to remove the tank. Uh, they negotiate with the property owner and say, well, uh, whatever transpired in the negotiations, I don't know who, but somebody pays for it. And, they, and then we move to remove the, uh, we need to remove the tank. And the first thing, of course, is to remove the water. So we pump out 4,000 gallons of water and send them to the recycler. And I am very happy, except late in the afternoon, it always happened at the end of the day, I get a call from the truck driver and says, Ami, I says, what? He says, they don't accept the water. I say, why? He says, well, because it is contaminated with hexavalent chromium. Well, hexavalent chromium is a highly, highly carcinogenic 
highly toxic uh, substance. So we have right now 4,000 gallons of water contaminated with highly toxic, and guess what? It came from this underground tank. Uh, well, to make the, the long story a little bit shorter, we get rid of the water. Eventually, we, we, we recycle the water, we send it to the recycler, we get rid of the water. But now we have a tank that used to have 4,000 gallons of water with chromium, hexavalent chromium, and we have to remove it out. So we, move to we get to remove it. Here is a tank in the excavation and ready to be removed. We, we expose it. We are, here is a, these are the original connections to the piping that was in the tank. And this is an opening that we open so that we can clean the tank inside and we can look inside and see what it is and we can ventilate it and prepare it for the removal. And the guys at the cleaning tap is called me says, well, let me take a look, take a look inside. Go ahead, look through the hole. And I'm looking through the hole and what do I see? Here is the bottom of the tank. And I see those three gaping holes shining at me from the bottom of the tank. So this tank is corroded. It has these holes. These holes are big. And they are at the bottom of the tank. And this tank used to have 4,000 gallons of water contaminated with hexavalent chromium. Well, you can, you can realize that I stopped breathing for a moment. I had to take a deep inhalation. Not because it is my risk, but because I have to tell this news to my client, um, what the risk that they are facing here. And uh, groundwater in this case is about 40 feet down. And if this contamination is this contamination reaches groundwater, this is a multi, multi-million dollar cleanup. So uh, anyway, we remove the tank. Here are the holes. And I put the little devil next to them uh, because there is a little devil here that we need to face. We need to understand uh, what, what this little uh, monster is, is up to, all right? So here are the holes in the tank. And here are, is a closer view. And I can stick my head through this hole, it's pretty big. So we remove the tank and uh, then we have the excavation. And I look down and I begin to feel a, a feeling of a little relief here because uh, uh, the, uh, I see the soil and the soil here, as you can see, the, the, the soil is in a way is, is cemented. And I say, well, maybe it stopped the water. Maybe the water did not leak because it's cemented under the tank. So we take samples. When we remove tank, we take samples. And here we are, we, we have the back hole and the back hole goes dig, go down to the bottom of the excavation. And this is how we take the sample. We dig down about five feet under the bottom. We take the sample, we send it to the lab and the sample comes clean. So in this case, uh, they lacked out. But it just tells you what, how important it is to know everything uh, about the case. And in this case, uh, yeah, they were fortunate. Nothing happened. It could have been bad, but it was not. So there was good news at the end. So here is the concept, the concept of a leaking tank. Uh, it's leaking underground. And uh, here is a case uh, in point, a uh, gasoline station. And the purple is free gasoline that is contaminated, uh, that is floating on the water. And it is, uh, here is a property here. Uh, this is, this rectangle is a property. And the free gasoline that is floating on the water moved out of the property into the neighboring property. Not only that, some of it dissolved in the water and as solvent in the water, it proceeded and go, went, uh, outside of the block, down the block, to this or to this block, and my client is sitting here, all right? And he's contaminate, being contaminated by these guys here. And this contamination, here is groundwater flow. This is where it goes. This is the, the blue arrow. It will keep coming at them. So this is a very complicated case. And again, I can talk half an hour about it, but it's a complicated case. Here is another case, uh, it's in, uh, I think it's in Riverside County. Uh, it used to be a, a metal salvage yard and the soil, it's about eight acres. They want to develop it into residential and the soil here is contaminated. It's not the end of the day, it's contaminated with uh, metals and, and other stuff. Here it is, it's contaminated with lead. Uh, it's contaminated with PCBs, it's a toxic material, but still it can be handled. And we'll talk a little bit more about it later. Um, let's skip this one. Uh, here is a recent case in, uh, that I showed you before in Silver Lake. Here is a property. It used to be a Terminix, Terminix uh, for, uh, pesticide facility. Uh, and the reason I show it to you is because um, 
back, my client purchased it in 2003. Uh, right before that, Terminix did the cleanup. And they clean up, they contaminated this pesticide, they clean it up, and you see here those patches of uh, dark asphalt. This is where they cleaned up, they removed the contaminated soil. However, uh, and there, there is always an however, <laughs> uh, they cleaned it up to what we call commercial standards. So as long as the property is commercial, as long as it is Terminix, so or our client used to use it as a warehouse, uh, it is okay, you can use it for commercial, but now this area, the Silver Lake, has become a um, uh, highly developed or uh, highly, uh, to say, wanted, desired residential community. Uh, price of real estate has gone up through the roof, and they want to redevelop it as residential. Well, if you want to make it residences, now you have to comply with residential standards, and what is left in place is not good for residential, you have to remove more. So we are getting retained to handle it. And here we are, uh, we have to do all these investigations to remove additional soil and we remove it. Uh, first, we have to demolish the building. We demolish all of it. And then we excavate. Here you see the contaminated soil, about 1,000 cubic yards. Everything removed and now they are happy. And they are, this building is not yet in place. It's going to be their 16 unit apartment building. Um, here's another case in Pico Rivera. There's a, a very old gasoline station going back. The pictures, I, they, I know they are taken in the late 1950s, and the reason I know it is because I see this uh, uh, Chevrolet Impala here. Here is the Impala, and this is maybe how it looked like uh, when it was brand new, but here it is in the picture. It's a Chevrolet Impala, and uh, I know that the picture was taken therefore in the late 1950s. And, uh, uh, this was used to be um, a mechanic shop, a service station, and right now it is a vacant land. And we found out that they contaminated it with lead. And the reason they contaminated it with lead, because old practices, uh, they used to have all these uh, automobile batteries. And automobile batteries are filled with acid, and the acid, the acid is filled with lead, because those batteries work on lead and acid. So the lead get into the acid, and all practices will sometimes just take the acid and dump it onto the land. Uh, these were good practices maybe in the past when, and this, this was okay in the past when we as a society were not aware of toxic substances. But nowadays we have a property that is contaminated with lead. It's not bad at all because it is in the upper surface. They are going to redevelop it, they are going to remove soil anyway, so they will remove it, and it's only two and a half, about two feet of the upper surface, and they can redevelop it into a very nice uh, property. So again, property contaminated, it's not the end of the day, we can do things about it. Uh, you will run, sometimes we run into metal plating, not anymore, uh, but we used to run into them uh, in the past. These are bad cases. And if you ever run into metal plating, I will not elaborate more about it right now. These are complicated cases. Just call us whether you retain us or not, but I will explain to you more about metal plating. I personally worked with metal plating facilities for a good three years in the 1980s. So I know much about them and I can explain to you uh, about it. So, but just know if you run into it, uh, it is a problem and, and call us. Um, Auto mechanics, uh, sometimes there are problems. This is uh, not so much of a problem, but sometimes there is a problem. What we are concerned in auto mechanics is uh, uh, maybe uh, hydraulic lifts. And I say maybe, because if we are in the county of Los Angeles, we are not concerned about it. But if we go to the county of Riverside, we are concerned about it because county of Riverside is concerned, county of Los Angeles is not concerned. As they say in other sectors, uh, pornography is a matter of geography. So sometimes uh, contamination is a matter of geography and uh, of a matter of who regulates it. And so uh, when it comes to hydraulic hoist, if you are in Riverside, yes, you need to be concerned about it. Again, LA County, don't be concerned about it. Uh, we have clarifiers, these are sub, uh, sub underground uh, tanks made of concrete. They are separating oil and grease and we are concerned about them. And many mechanic shops has them, and when we see them, we want to test uh, around them. 
uh, dry cleaners. Dry cleaners has become uh, the uh, quote unquote again the culprit of the day. And again, I'm not placing any blame on any uh, dry cleaner. Uh, they are not to blame. Uh, they were again they were old practices of the past. Uh, we as a, we as a society we enjoyed and still enjoying the services of uh, dry cleaning and. Uh, but it so happened that in the 1900s, early 1900s, uh, around 1920, I think, uh, they started to use a dry cleaning solvent called PERC. PERC, or it's short for perchloroethylene. And this is highly carcinogenic. And we became aware of it probably in the late, in the 1980s, 1990s. And uh, as the years goes by, we are becoming more and more concerned about it. Uh, it is a probable carcinogen, it is a central nervous system depressant, it, and again, it enters the body uh, through inhalation or even contact through skin. I mean, uh, not very much like maybe our <laughs> COVID-19 uh, friend, all right? So it enters the body through inhalation and contact with the skin. Uh, and uh, it is banned in use, in, uh, it has been banned in use in California for two in 2007 and all use will stop into 2023. Evidence suggests that exposure increases the risk of Parkinson's disease uh, ninefold. And I got a call one day in the middle, not middle of the night, but very late, and maybe it was 9 p.m. at night. I got a call from a person who used to be an operator or a dry cleaner. He used to own it for many, many years. And I was very concerned because now he and his wife having this Parkinson's disease. So it is a risk. And uh, it is uh, measurable and definitely a risk. And uh, not only that, if it catches fire, then guess what? In temperatures over 315 centigrade, almost 600 Fahrenheit, the perk, the PCE, can oxidize into phosgene. And phosgene is an extremely poisonous gas. So that becomes, um, if you have a dry cleaner that has a PCE container, or when you have an industrial plant with PCE containers and they catch, they catch fire, well, the, fire, the firefighters uh, will, will be very concerned about it. So this is PERC, and it is a very concern for us. Um, we can skip this one. Uh, machine shops, uh, they are concerned if there was a historical use to the property as a machine shop. Is a concern because uh, they used to use uh, solvents uh, which are have, uh, uh, could be toxic. Uh, uh, leach pits, uh, septic tanks, leach pits could be a concern if the property became uh, an industrial or commercial property because whatever you dump into the sink goes into the ground, percolates into the ground. So when it was residential, no problem, but once it turns into commercial, or semi-industrial or industrial, we are very concerned about septic tanks because whatever you dump there goes into the ground and percolates. And if groundwater is nearby, it will go to groundwater. So we talk, to, we talk a lot about the devil, okay, which is a contamination. And um, we say that uh, the devil, better the devil you know than the devil you don't know. So knowledge is power and with knowledge, we may be able to handle it. So this is where we enter into the phase one, uh, to the phase one uh, thing, to the phase one industry. And again, the phase one is intended, intended to handle these concerns and it does certain things and it does not do other things. Uh, phase one, so what is phase one? So first of all, when we talk about phase one, we need to decide what is an environmental concern. Uh, in the early 1990s, uh, the industry, uh, bankers, the industry I means the lenders, the real estate industry, regulators, consultants, convened together to decide what is an environmental concern that which we should be aware of in transacting uh, with real estate properties, with real estate. What do we really need to be concerned? What is our concern, all right? And, uh, because the concern of the real estate industry is not always the concern of the regulator. These are two different uh, uh, universes, all right? Yes, they, they combine together in certain areas, but what the regulator is concerned about it is not the real estate agent or the real estate transactors. The real estate uh, owner 
they want to transact with the property, they want to buy or sell, and they want to live healthy. And maybe in living healthy is that where we meet the regulatory industry. So what we need to define the concern in terms of that will enable us to, to proceed with real estate transactions because in the late 1980s, there was a lot of concern that stopped real estate transactions. So they defined it, they made a definition and they call it the recognized environmental condition. And here is a definition and it's a very complex one. And, I'm, and I put the number 36 here because I'm sure that we had the good attorneys <laughs> involved in this definition. And when you have attorneys involved, the definitions is a little bit complex for the lay person because this is a long sentence. The presence or likely presence of any hazardous substance or petroleum products in, on, or at a property, one, due to release to the environment, two, under conditions indicative of a release to the environment, three, under conditions that pose material threat of a future release to the environment. I mean, I get a headache when I look at this definition. And I had to break it up to components and I broke it up to 36 components. I can make you 36 different concerns out of this one sentence, okay? So it is complex, but uh, this is what we have to work with and uh, I'm used to it and, uh, <laughs> and I'm trying to make it simple for, for others. And uh, the term environmental concern is not intended to include de minimis conditions. There are certain conditions of contamination or concern that are de minimis, they are of little magnitude and we'll talk more about it. So we move into the phase one and we want to find recognized environmental conditions and here are some examples. Here is a uh, phase one, we did the phase one and we entered the property and here is uh, an electrical room and we see the drum and the drum stand next to electrical panel and here at the bottom it is corroded and it's leaking down and you see all this stuff, it's very sticky because when I stopped, when I stepped into it, my shoe got stuck there, all right? So it's very sticky substance. Sticky meaning there is probably some petroleum in it and it's leaking fine right next to an electrical panel. So it is of course of a concern and this is what we call a recognized environmental condition. Here is another case. This is a property where we removed the tanks in the early 1990s here in this area of the property. Uh, we removed the tanks and we got a clean bill of health from, from the regulator. So one would say, yes, it's not of a concern, right? In a way, uh, because we get an interested party, they are calling us and they want to purchase this property. And they say to us, well, he says, Ami, uh, we have a clean bill of health, right? I said, yes, absolutely. He says, we don't have anything to be concerned about it. I said, well, it depends. You, want, you probably want to redevelop the place. He says, yes, I want to redevelop it. You are probably going to dig down for subterranean garage. He says, yes, that's what my plan. I said, well, guess what? Uh, here is the property again. Here is the area when we removed the tanks. Here is the, the yellow area. And we removed all of the contamination from the excavation at the time. And we went down 18 feet and we cleaned it all up. But in the process of cleaning it up, we left contamination in place. Uh, this is another site that we dealt with. This is a school site, but just to show you, when they uh, uh, developed the property and they were excavating to build the school, all of a sudden they ran into this contamination that I circled here uh, in place. And uh, the construction stopped because this was a petroleum contamination and it was oozing out heavy vapors that cause headaches to the workers. And the construction stopped. And here we are standing and spraying it with uh, a vapor suppressant uh, to quench down the vapors that are coming out. And, uh, and it was a surprise and we don't want this kind of surprises. Like uh, in this case, I'm telling him, once you excavate down and you go down, you may encounter contamination that was left under the excavation at the time, uh, which happened in this case. So uh, they have to be aware of it. Uh, anyway, here is another case uh, of contamination, but we'll skip this because time is getting short. Here is another case of a phase one. And uh, when we walk into a property and if we see all these uh, drums and uh, they, we don't see any contamination in the ground. We don't see, but we say oh, there is a presence of hazardous substances in a condition 
that can pose a material threat of a future release. This is a condition that can release uh, contamination to the environment. So we, we indicate it as a concern, as an environmental condition in our report. Uh, here is another case. Our client wants, he already owns this property and he wants to redevelop it. But guess what? Around it, this is in Northern California in Redwood country. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of uh, lumber industry in this area and they cut the, the trees down and shipped them down the river and the, river, and the trees came down here and there was a lumber mill here all around and the lumber mill used all kinds of poisons to treat uh, the wood. At the time, it was okay, but those poisons contaminated all the groundwater in the area. Groundwater here is at five feet. Our client is sitting here and we are telling him, look, my dear client, this contamination which is in the water in all likelihood came under your property. So you have a condition here of a likely presence of hazardous substances because of a known release to the environment. And this is impacting his property. If you are going to redevelop it, you are sitting five feet above contaminated water. You will have this and this and this and these expenses. Well, they decided at this time, they decided to cancel the project. Um, here is another case. Uh, this is in the city of Los Angeles, not far away. This is what is today Beverly Center. Uh, what the Fairfax district is here, the Grove is someplace here, Beverly Center, Beverly Hills is here, and the entire area used to be an oil field here, a lot of wells here, and a lot of abandoned, probably hundreds of abandoned wells here, and they are contaminating the area with asphalt and tar, and uh, when we deal with properties here, we, we, need to under, we need to know that there is this condition. Uh, Metal plating show, we discussed this. Uh, here is a condition of, again, we see these tanks and they are corroded and we say, well, there is a likely presence. These tanks may contain substances that could be hazardous and we declare it is a condition that we need to be concerned about it. Here is what we call a de minimis condition. This is uh, a, an auto mechanic and uh, he, it's the interesting part about it is that this property is located in the San Fernando Valley. I think it is in, um, in uh, Reseda, or the, no, it's in Reseda. And, uh, and our client, it's a, it's a, it's a residential property, it's a entirely residential property in a neighborhood, except uh, the previous owner, the uh, late owner, I should say, because they're not alive anymore, but. Uh, uh, they had a hobby to restore old uh, cars and they built this garage uh, in, in the backyard of the property. And we walk there and we see the garage and you see there is a the hoist here and all of this uh, quote unquote contamination on the surface. But we say this is the minimus because we look at it and say, no, uh, we are not concerned here about contamination and, uh, and a very light case, uh, go ahead and, and, uh, and do it purchase the property. So the concern here is very small and it's called the minimis condition. So uh, again, so what, how do we do it? So th these are the environmental conditions that we are concerned. How do we, how do we get to them? How do we define them? How do we recognize them? What the heck is a phase one? What do we do? Eventually we issue this report called phase one environmental site assessment. How do we get to issue this report? What are the components of the report? Well, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, the user of the property. The user is the, the, the person, the party that is very interested in our doing this phase one report for them. And the user may include an acquirer of the property. It could be a potential tenant. Uh, somebody, uh, they want to move into the property and lease it. They want to know if they are leasing a property with a problem. So it's a potential tenant. It could be the owner. Many times we are being retained by the owners before they sell the property. I, I'm sorry, just a second, there is a background noise and I will close the window, just a second. Sorry for the noise. Okay, handled. Double, double pane windows will handle everything. So uh, uh, 
Okay, so the owner of the property, uh, yes, um, they want to sell and they want to be in charge. They want to be to know ahead of time uh, what is happening. And uh, many times it, it's good to know ahead of time when you get into transaction and you want to sell a property. Uh, as we say, he who knows uh, is in control. Knowledge is control. So the person that knows is, has more control on the transaction than if they move into the transaction and they're in escrow and then don't know anything about the property that they're going to sell. Uh, lenders are users, uh, sometimes retained by lenders, property managers, anybody can retain us. Sometimes uh, we, we, had, <laughs> we had those cases. A guy is interested in a property, he, hasn't, he haven't even made an offer, he, haven't, he hasn't told, they haven't, they haven't told anybody that they want a the property, but they are interested and they retain us and say, well, tell us about this property. And uh, so we do a phase one without even telling uh, the owner, yes, uh, we cannot enter into the property, but uh, we can fly about it if we wanted to. So today we have drones. Uh, in the past, uh, years ago, we, we did it with helicopters and we flew over properties up in the sky and took pictures. So today we even have, we have a Google. We can go to Google and took some area, look uh, from a bar on a property and see what is there. So we have a lot of means today to inspect the property even without uh, putting a step inside the property. So anybody can uh, do a phase one. Uh, the person that does this phase one has to be an environmental professional. And uh, the, an environmental professional is defined by the United States Environmental Protection Agency. There is a very, uh, not very, but there is a precise uh, definition of who is an environmental professional. And he or she who does uh, the uh, phase one should meet the specific uh, education, experience, and certification requirements uh, by the US uh, EPA. So that's another component of the phase one. Uh, another component is review of federal, state, and local government records. There is a lot of review. We have to go out, so you can see here, a lot of record. And it's not that we are going to open each and every file of it, because fortunately, very fortunately, we are in the, um, uh, what you call, in the virtual uh, age, in the computer age. Uh, most of the agencies nowadays have uh, uh, scanned and uh, uh, basically um, uh, put uh, the files in, uh, in, uh, in uh, electronic records. So uh, we can look into electronic records and that's a big, big advantage. So, but we still, we are looking into many records, sometimes thousands of records this way. And we uh, review historical sources. We look into the history we, until the time it was first developed. Uh, the uh, standards of the industry that were developed by the ASTM, American Society for Testing and Materials, tell us that you have to go to the time it was first uh, developed. So we do that. We, we check all kinds of historical resources. For example, aerial photography. These are aerials of a recent project, and uh, uh, this aerial, I think, in the early 1900s, uh, they still had, had aerials, and then we go out through the years, and we see how the property developed over the years, and it tells us about the property, it tells us about the neighborhood. Uh, we do uh, topographic maps, and uh, again, go into the history of the property, and we go topographic maps, they go back to the 1800s. We have map, maps from the 1800s, and uh, I think this map is from the late 1800s. And they develop on time, and in time those maps show the development of the area, how it developed, and it, until it goes, until here, down here, it's, it's fully developed. And it tells us the history of the property. We check government databases, 130 government databases, all electronic, of course. We, we, cannot, <laughs> we cannot do it uh, in person. We do it electronically, and we have, uh, people that we retain, that this is their specialty to retrieve all these records. Uh, there are expert uh, service providers that all what they do 24-7 uh, is they go to all these electronic databases and they retrieve those records. And eventually they give us those maps. Here is a map, our target property is here in, in, the, in, the, in the center. And then we go circles around it. This circle is one quarter of a mile, and the second circle is half a mile, and the up, outer circle is uh, one mile. And first, they show us all these uh, red clouds of contaminated groundwater in the area. Our property is not sitting 
right now on a known groundwater contamination, which is good news. Uh, and then uh, they tell us all these red flags here that you see, all these red flags are properties here. And the red flags are properties that are sitting what we call a, above gradient, meaning they are sitting up here. All the black uh, spots here are properties that are sitting down gradient, which we mean downhill uh, in, from the property. And uh, all of these black and red are properties uh, that have the potential to contaminate uh, the area. So since we are buying, not, not we, our client is buying or selling this property, uh, we want to know if there is a potential impact from these properties. And potential meaning even an impact that is not known yet, not known to anybody, but may be known in the future. We want to know if it is there. Uh, so uh, all these 130 government databases eventually give us, and this map is not showing every detail because I wanted to make it a little bit simple, uh, but it shows us all the concerns that we need to be around it. When I go to this map and I click on any one of these, right away uh, a window uh, and uh, with a menu will open up and I can go into each of these properties and I can read about it and see what is there, uh, what here, history, uh, can, can see a lot. And this is where we start analyzing potential impacts on our property. We look into wetlands. Okay, here is a, a wetland and here is a, but it is far from the property. We are not concerned about it. Uh, we, do ins we do physical inspection of the property. We go inside, uh, we check every nook and crevice. We look into any telltale, telltale signs of, of, of contamination. And uh, we take a lot of uh, photographs. Uh, uh, we take hundreds and hundreds of, 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 of photographs. And eventually from all these photographs, we produce what we call a photographic log. Here is a map of our photographic log, uh, and it shows you the select pictures that we put in our report. Uh, from the hundreds of pictures that we take, we don't anticipate our client to go to hundreds of pictures. We take only those that we think could be of much interest. In this specific case, we took about 400 pictures, and uh, we, zero, we zeroed it down to how many? Like about 40, 42 about 42 pictures uh, at the end. So, and all those maps, we show every picture where, where it was taken, in what direction it was taken. These are all the photographs that we took outdoors. This is our target property here. These are all the properties surrounding it. And these are here on the left bottom. These are all the pictures that we took inside uh, the property. I'm not going to show you the, photo, the pictures themselves, but just you know that they are there. Um, we go into historical city directories, and uh, those directories tell us a lot about uh, the uh, occupants of the subject properties that we investigate, and also about the occupants around it. Uh, the names of the names that appear in the city directories give us clues as to what businesses, what kind of operations uh, were there at the time, and. Uh, we can get records in recent projects. I had to go through about 1800s, <laughs> about 1800s of these entries, okay, uh, to see uh, what, was, what was there. So it is an extensive uh, investigation for and this, to those historical city directories, and they go back uh, decades, many decades go back. So it's another clue of the history. So at the end, we issue our report, which is a phase one environmental site assessment. And we state our findings, what we found. Findings is a statement of facts. These are the facts. Then we give an opinion. An opinion is not a fact. We need to remember there's a great big difference between opinion and fact. And different consultants can have different opinions on the same fact. Uh, and we know that. I mean, if, if you've ever been in a trial and you hired expert witnesses, uh, the uh, and I've been expert witness in a few cases. Uh, it depends if you are expert witness for the uh, litigator on the uh, part of the defendant or the part of the uh, plaintiff, all right? And different experts, uh, just go to the O.J. Simpson case, uh, different experts will have different opinions on the same findings. So uh, 
and this is natural. I'm not saying that anybody of the experts is lying. Uh, I'm not saying that anybody of the experts is biased, but it is natural for different experts to have different opinions. So anyway, so that's opinions. And then we have conclusions and then we make the recommendations. Sometimes uh, the client says uh, that they don't want any recommendations, so we don't, we are not obligated to make recommendations, so we, are, we only leave it with finding opinions and conclusions. Our job, our responsibility as a consultant is to give you the findings, give you our opinion, and give you our conclusions. This is our professional uh, responsibility. And then uh, sometimes we find that we need to do a phase two. Phase two means we have concerns that we need to explore. That's a phase two, we explore concerns. And uh, so uh, phase two, again, what does it do? Uh, I, we find out, excuse me for a moment, I just need to take a sip of water. We find out that there are, in quite a few cases, there are unreal expectations as to what phase two does. Uh, and uh, phase two, first and foremost, is a yes or no answer. Basically, the recognized environmental condition, and I put here those uh, arm wrestling, because this is either you win or you not win. Yes, yeah, sometimes it's a draw, sometimes I understand, but uh, it's a yes or no. Uh, you make it or you don't make it. So the, uh, the phase two environmental investigation is a yes or no answer. Is it contaminated? Is it not contaminated? That's all. And uh, uh, here, is, here are a couple of recent examples. Uh, this property here on the right, uh, we did the phase one. We were concerned about lead contamination because this property is sitting next to a freeway and very close to the freeway, and we are con concerned about airborne uh, lead. Uh, and because freeways in the past, we, we, we had leaded gasoline, leaded gasoline evaporated and deposed, uh, deposited, sorry, uh, uh, lead on nearby property. So this one is sitting like smack dab with a freeway, and we are concerned about lead in the upper surface. So, uh, so we tell that we say phase one, we are concerned about lead. So we do phase two. So we go there and we do this, what I call matrix sampling. So this matrix here, or sampling pattern. We sample all over the property. Every red dot is a sample, but there are a total of 54 samples here. Now, if we were to analyze all 54, it would be damn expensive. So what we do, we divide them in groups of four. You see, four, 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 four. We take four samples in each group. We composite them. We combine them together into one sample, and we run the test only on the composite sample. And this way, we can at least know we can save money on the on the on the testing. And then, if any one group show contamination, we can concentrate on the one group that shows contamination. So, in this case, so this is a phase two. But the, in this case, the phase two is as we go down, we poke holes. In this case, we don't even poke holes because we are concerned about lead on the surface. So we we collect dirt from the surface. We analyze it. Now, if this dirt comes contaminated then we'll have to go and do additional investigation and see how wide, how deep. This is not the phase two. The phase two is just to say, is there, is there not? And if there is contamination, is it of a concern? Here is another case, a recent case. Again, phase one indicates concern of toxic vapor in the ground. So again, we move there. We do this, call it matrix. I call it matrix sampling. We have 15 points of sampling and uh, we punch holes, we go down, we punch holes, we show in a minute how we do it, and we suck out the vapor from these 16, 15 points. We can do it in one day, and we have our lab, we have a mobile lab sitting on the property, and we feed them the samples as we go along, and they give us the results as we go along. By the end of the day, we already know what is happening here. In this case, good news, it's not contaminated. But this again, this is a phase two, we just yes or no. Now, if we were to find contamination in any one spot here, and he's going, uh, the owner is going to redevelop it as a residential. And if we were to find contamination, and this is residence, uh, well, we would have to do more investigation. We would have to go down, we would have to go deeper, we would have to go wider. We will have to go a lot of investigation here in order to really say, uh, what will it cost to remediate it? But this is not the subject, this is not the phase two. and I, I, and. It happened to me once, uh, not once in a while, but quite sometimes that a, a person comes to me and says, well, Ami, you did the phase two. 
you found some contamination, how much will it cost me to clean it up? It's, we cannot say. Phase two is just to tell you if you are contaminated, basically to tell you if you are sick or not. It's like a doctor. I mean, we measure your temperature, we measure your pulse, I know we take a couple of blood tests, and we say, well, do you know you are sick? Well, doctor, how sick am I? Well, I don't know, I need to do more, okay? So that's, that's, that's the equivalent here, that's a phase two. So uh, how do we do it? Uh, okay, here are some of the machines that we use. Uh, this machine here, the illustration, we are pushing uh, hollow tubes into the ground. Here is, a, here is on the right side. This is a hollow tube, and we are pushing them into the ground, and this is a plug here. When you push it into the ground, the plug is down at the bottom. When we get to this, the depth that we want to sample, we release the plug, and we push the tube further, and then uh, the tube gets filled with the dirt. We pulled it out. Here it is pulled out. Here is the dirt. Now we can take the sample from the dirt and send it to the lab, and we, uh, our geologist can look at it. I'm not a geologist, so I always, when, we are, when I need that, I retain a geologist, and he looks at it, and he tells me, Ami, what do you know? This is a clay seal, silty clay. Uh, this is so-and-so. It gives you all these geological terms that I'm familiar with, but because I'm not a certified geologist, uh, I need to have a certified geologist on site uh, to, to sign the report. So he says, what is in the soil? This is a, the geologist to tell us how is the soil. And then we sample it and we send it to the lab and uh, uh, the lab tells us what is the contamination. And then I can exercise an opinion as to what type of contamination is this. So, um, uh, that's the machine. This is uh, what we use in a phase two. And here is the real machines in life. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, here it, is, here it is outside. This big machine got punching holes, going down, taking samples. Uh, sometimes uh, the machine is not uh, strong enough to go down because the, the soil may contain cobbles and uh, maybe we have to go very deep. So we have to use the more robust machines. Here is the robust machine. It's uh, what we call open flight auger. Uh, this is like a big screw, rotating screw. It goes down into the surface and it is hollow. And inside here we have our sampler and we collect the samples. So that's another machine. Here is a more dramatic view of the machine and sometimes we need uh, to use it. Uh, here is another, some other picture of the same machine that I showed you before. This is what the, the push machine, which is a hydraulic push machine. Uh, here is again the machine you see, we can do it indoors, uh, depends here, here is a big machine, there is a high ceiling, we can use it, here is a low ceiling, we have to use a smaller machine, the smaller the machine, the lesser the, capa the capability, but uh, it's, it's a good use. Uh, here is how we take, uh, here is how we take the um, vapor samples uh, from the soil, and uh, we stick a probe uh, into the ground, here is the tip of the probe, here is a little tube going up, 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 going up, up, going into a vacuum pump. And here is a vacuum pump here, and it sucks out, sucks out the vapor from the soil onto the vacuum pump. After we suck enough vapor so that we know it's representative of the surrounding, then we stick a syringe. Here, here is our syringe. We stick it here, and we take the sample. Here you see this lady, uh, and she is, here is a syringe, and here is the pump here. And here is a syringe and she's sticking it here and she's taking the sample and then we put it into the machine that is telling us what is in there, uh, how toxic is uh, the vapor. Uh, these machines uh, we use to, the, to discover if we have tanks in the ground and we have cases where uh, they, uh, phase one is telling us that there used to be tanks in the ground but nobody removed them. Uh, there is no record that the tanks have ever been removed. So they may still be there, they may not be there, we don't know, we need to know. And then we retain these uh, experts with their equipment and they go around and we have people that we have been working with them for the past 30 years and they are very, very professional. And, and uh, they tell us, they give us a complete picture of what is underground and if they have tanks or not. So uh, what is the cost? Okay, phase one process, uh, usually typical phase one, $1,800 to $3,000, uh, depend on the site, depend on the complexity. Uh, phase two, usually commercial property can run $6,000 to $20,000. Uh, just yesterday, I gave a quote for, how much was it, $14,000. Uh, a month ago, I did one for $7,000. Uh, so it depends on the case. I would say 
6,000 to 20,000 is a good range for, for a phase two. Uh, if you go to industrial uh, properties, uh, the cost of the phase two is, is much higher and it can run into uh, uh, many tens of thousands of dollars. So um, a phase two environmental site assessment, what does it not do? Again, it does certain things. What does it not do? I already elaborated it a little bit and I'll tell you again here. Phase two, here is a property is contaminated. It will tell us if it is contaminated, but it will not give us this entire picture that you see here. For us to get into this entire picture, when we did this case, uh, how much was it? Uh, uh, this, was, this was close to $200,000. Yeah, by the time we, we knew the picture in these details, the investigation was close to 200, just the investigation, no, no cleanup, just the investigation was close to $200,000. So uh, uh, this is not a phase two. And if you do a phase two, you just retain us. We go into this property, you tell them, oh, it's contaminated. No, it's not contaminated. Yes, you have to worry about it. No, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, let's skip this one. We already talked about that. Okay, uh, phase one and phase two time schedule. Okay, we can do a phase one report in three weeks. As a <laughs> about a couple of weeks ago, uh, a good uh, friend, a uh, real estate agent, she called me and she said, well, Ami, I have this transaction. Uh, we, we are in escrow. And we, I said, how long? He says, she says, two week escrow. He says, we want, and the, and the buyer wants a phase one. Can you do it in a week? <laughs> well, I, I laughed like I laugh it now. And I said, well, maybe, after, uh, maybe, but if I do it in a week, I probably will have to charge you maybe triple, you know, because I'll have to work uh, 24 seven, nonstop. And even then by the end of the week, I may not have all of the information. Um, but this is no kidding. If I had to do it in a week, I would have to work straight on probably uh, 14, 16, uh, more than that, probably a good 16 to 18 hours a day uh, to do it in, in, in a week. So it's next to impossible, but a real good time is three weeks. Sometimes we like to even ask for four weeks, but three weeks is a good for phase one. Phase two can be done in three weeks. But realize if you are in a transaction, okay, and you have a limited time in escrow, and in my experience, once we give the phase one out, and if we have certain findings, if it is not a clean property, if we have some concern and we say, okay, yeah, phase one, we are concerned about the property, you need to do a phase two, well, guess what? Then the, the, uh, the buyer and the seller, they engage in, in, in negotiations. And sometimes it take weeks and weeks and weeks. And by the time the tellers move to, to do a phase two, uh, it takes time. And then we do the phase two, uh, about three weeks. Uh, and, uh, and again, it, and then it takes time for them to get the results and they negotiate and negotiate and it takes time. And eventually they say, well, do a little bit more investigation and we do more and it takes time. So it can, can be 20 to 28 weeks before they, get, before they know what to do. And this is uh, not unheard of. You have to be aware of it, okay? So it's always good, and, and I encourage people do this phase one before you enter, before even before you enter ESCO, uh, if you can, okay, and just do it. But if you are in ESCO, uh, don't do a two-week ESCO if you are doing phase one. It's impossible. So, uh, uh, but we can shorten the times. We can do if you are really in a time crunch, we can do a phase one, move into it in less than two weeks. I will know if you are, we will know if you have concern. And then we tell you, and before we do the report, you can tell us, go ahead and do the phase two. And we can do the phase two right away. And then you will have phase one and phase two, and sometimes even an extended phase two, all done maybe in six weeks. But you will have to move fast, okay? And be a little bit informal uh, with us and uh, accept informal results, and then you can do it faster. So, uh, uh, real quick about uh, cleanup and remediation, real quick, a uh, few words about that. Uh, how we will clean up? First, one thing is dig a hole. If you can dig it out, many times this is a way to go. If you can dig it out and to take it away, uh, that seems to me in many cases is the cheapest, uh, most economical way. But remember, uh, dig it, when you dig it, you are limited in, 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 in depth. All right, how much can you dig down? So. Uh, that's a big limitation on excavation. Uh, another one is what we call air sparging and soil vapor extraction. We have here, we have groundwater which is contaminated 
and uh, the contamination is in the water. We want to get it out. What do we do? We insert the tube in and we blow air. Like you look in the left here, okay? This is aquarium, okay? What you do, you feed air into the aquarium and it bubble up, bubble, 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 go up, okay? And out of the water. When the, when the air bubbles through the water, okay, the contamination, if there is contamination in the water, it will enter into the air bubbles. And there are certain laws of physics here, which I'm not going to elaborate about it, but trust me, uh, if there is contamination in the water, it will move into the air bubbles. And the air bubbles will carry it up and the water, the bubbles go up and when they go up to the surface, what happens, they explode, okay? They cannot be bubbles anymore. So here again, we are in the groundwater, it goes up, 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 and it explodes and, the, and becomes vapor, free vapors in the ground. And then we sink in another well here, we suck it out through this well, out it goes, and that's how we treat the groundwater. That's one way. Another way is um, uh, just what we call engineering and administrative controls. Basically, we don't clean it up. We just cover it. We do it in golf courses sometimes. We just cover it. Or in the worst case, we don't even enter there. So that's not a solution for a real estate transaction. Uh, this is a very important tool that you need to know about it. It's called Land Use Covenant. Uh, which uh, it's done in many cases with the regulatory agency. Basically, you can leave, the regulators agree for you to leave the, con the property contaminated on certain conditions and they impose certain restrictions. They say, well, okay, uh, you can uh, leave it, but you will not be able to put a kindergarten. You will not be able to put a hospital there. You will not be able uh, to put residential there. But yes, you can continue to be industrial. Uh, yes, you can continue to be uh, commercial uh, with certain limitations. And uh, so when you deal with transactions, you need to understand that properties do not always have to be cleaned up all the way and you can still have solutions to them. Uh, by oxidations, we can, uh, there is a limited benefit to it, but we can inject chemicals into the ground and just by pure chemical reaction, we can uh, decontaminate the soil. Um, this is, uh, if, it's, if the contamination is in vapor, just in vapor in the soil, we can just suck it out like, like, like a vacuum cleaner. Here is soil, there is vapor, we put those wells in, we suck out the vapor and this is how we clean it up. Um, sometimes we use uh, the microbes in the ground. We have a lot of bacteria in the ground. If it is petroleum contamination, bacteria loves petroleum. Okay, they feed on it like ice cream. And uh, so, what we do is there is a petroleum and we encourage them to eat the petroleum and we feed them nutrients that they like even more than the petroleum. And they eat those nutrients, they give the, here are the nutrients coming down in green, the bacteria eat it and then they get encouraged enough and they also chew on the petroleum and this way they eliminate eventually the petroleum. So this is one way and the bacteria is a very cheap label. All what you have to do is just give them food. They work 24 seven, you know, there is no workers comp insurance and uh, uh, that's, that's nice, very nice. You don't have to worry about this. No employment taxes. <laughs> so I thought the microbes. All right. So another way is mother nature, what we call natural attenuation. In some cases, we just leave it in place. Uh, it's not an immediate risk to public health in the environment. Uh, it can be left in place. And mother nature will take care of it. It's mother nature has all these bugs in the ground and eventually you shall take care of it. And I'm giving credit for this uh, painting to Jim Warren, he's an artist, jimwarren.com. Many, many, many years ago, he gave me permission to show his uh, creations on my, uh, in my classes. So uh, I'm, not <laughs> I'm not benefiting from it. So uh, just, I like his pictures. So uh, here we are. So this is Mother Nature. And um, uh, in the end, what to say, what is the aim of education? The aim of education, uh, Herbert Spencer, a great educator is telling us, is not knowledge, it's action. Whenever we want to know something, we want to be able to act. Knowledge for knowledge, uh, maybe it's good for, uh, uh, for impression, to impress other people that we know something, but it's not good for action. It's not, so uh, it's, action is important if we use the knowledge for action. So I, I hope that by what we delivered it today, you will be able to act more. And uh, you're always welcome to call me and as I said, here we are. I'm sorry, the thank you note, but even beyond the thank you note, if you have questions, 
always call a uh, call or text uh, 323-899-5001. That's my phone. I'm always available. And and uh, even late at night, even through holidays, uh, email ami a at amiadini.com and ask me a question. And again, uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, we took a lot to go. You have been very patient with me. And I thank you very, very, very much. And uh, goodbye. And see you again next time. Thank you, Mr. Adini. That was very, very informative. We really appreciate what you shared with us. And thank you for offering to uh, consult with, with our, uh, our guests and our members. Um, so when you all do, are doing your transactions, please take advantage of uh, some of the speakers that we bring you because it's, it, we want to create a win-win situation. We want them to speak and we want them to be able to benefit from business transactions as well. Um, so next month, uh, we'll meet again, August 11th, 12 o'clock to 1, 1.30ish. Uh, we haven't solidified a speaker yet, so bear with us. Just uh, go to the website, wsgvar.com and uh, select uh, education from the menu and uh, you'll see the schedule there. Thanks again and have a great day. Stay safe. Bye-bye.